Hi, this is Greg Hildebrandt. I've been a professional artist for 62 years. I've done a lot of artwork in that time, and I'm still just trying to get it right. Hey, Greg, how are you doing, sir? Greetings and hallucinations. Greetings and hallucinations. So, yeah, we had a little bit of a technical, a bit of a technical snafu. If you yeah. Know. Um, so hello to everybody that's already tuning in. We got some people jumping on to the stream already. So hello. And, uh, so here we are again with lady death two weeks in a row. Yes. Now, you know, last week, you know, you and I had discussed that you would probably be done with this thing. Um, but then through the course of the week, you decided to work on some other stuff and hold on to this a little bit longer to give people the yeah. opportunity to see it a little bit further along. Is that yes. correct? Yes. And uh, so I started, as we can see, started to put the figure in. And that was quite some another story. I remember last week I was talking about the lighting setup. Yeah, remember? we were talking about the, the, the fire in the backlight. And then the dome light, uh, the blue. Dome, the blue light of the sky, the whole blue coming. light of the sky visualizing it's all lighting. So I'm imagining, you know, all the blue light coming down. You can see it on the skulls and the foreground here. Mm -hmm. And it's literally on these buildings on the distance too. the blue light is, is darker. Then I started to put her in up here in her head with the same colors is which would have was a, a blue under that blue sky light. And I'm painting it, and something isn't feeling right quite. I'm trying, you know how that thing is that you're not, you know, when you're not, it, something is wrong. I asked Jean to come over. She came over and took a look. I said, Jean, come over and take a look at this, would you? Help me out, you know, just take a look. She goes, oh, that's too blue. She's got to be white. I mean, she's pale. She's white. And I and I, and I go into, I, that, that blows my whole color theory. She's lit with this blue light coming down from the sky. And she's edge lit, but the fire, what the hell color am I going to put on her to make it a white light, to make her white? And she says, well, does her scythe do anything? Does it glow or something? I said, what? So she went and looked, pulled some internet stuff up of, you know, previous artists, Lady Death throughout time. And there it seemed to be glowing, or at least her sword certainly is on fire, you know, glowing. So I said, oh, fantastic. So I came back, painted the scythe in. You know, I'm thinking, well, what the hell? How's it glowing? You know, and then you go into the, ah, uh, it's like a lightning sort of thing, which I'm still working on. And then that lights her up. So, Very nice. so I've got, I've got some questions. We've got some people saying hi. Ted says that you're a magician. And then Bob Kinkle says, hello, Greg. Bob, how are you? And Ted. Ted and Bob. So, Ted and, and Bob. Alice or something. Uh <laughs> So, yeah, so uh, it, it it you know it worked. I mean, I could you know get my my blue whitish blue. Actually, it goes still into the blue shadows as you can see, because that's what is the ambient light all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, is it working? Looks like it's working to me. <laughs> that's it. See, who who said it? Neil Adams? I think it's got to look right or be right. Yeah. Right. So. So I, I've got a question for you then. You know, you were saying that it was it was just coming across as too blue. The flesh was too blue. Yeah. Uh, based upon your um, your ambient light source. Right. Right. Now, could you have just taken it more to white? Like. Why did you feel the need to add a, a, a new third tertiary light source in? Why well, the blue you just amp it up to white because I'm, 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 I, you know, my thing is it's like with lighting, I'm always uh, more or less for the most part. I'm, I'm, it's a, it's a truth to nature that I'm after, you know, with, with real light. Okay. In other words, we talked about. I have to really understand what's the light source, where is it coming from, what color is it, or else I can't paint a picture. You know, you have to know all that, all that stuff. 
So there was no justification for making her white other than just arbitrarily painting her white. And I don't paint like that, you know. And I mean, I mean, people do. I'm, I'm sure they pull it off. I can't. I, I just don't think that way. You know, I wouldn't even think to try it because it's to me, it just doesn't go with a truth to nature approach. So I, I had to come up with a light source here to light her up because my plan was to keep her lit from the top, you know, more. Yeah. And that provided the perfect opportunity is make this side glow and have that be the light source. So it's like the truth to nature thing. I, I, I have to justify, know where the light is, what the light is, why it's there. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. So that's so Do you, do you, uh, have you ever found yourself in a situation, uh, to where you couldn't justify that truth to nature uh, light source and and had to uh, fake it for lack of a better term in that in that scenario. Yeah, I'm sure I have. I can't remember anything right outright right now, but it probably was probably was years ago before I really was realizing that I lighting I had to understand where the light was and what the light was and where it was coming from. There, when you're playing and, and putzing around, you're kind of like uh, operating out of lack of knowledge or grasp or understanding or grokking it, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so you are you you find you're up, shit's creep without a paddle sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And you go, oh, what the... In, in the old days, what that meant was, especially it was dangerous, if there was going to be a romp, because I was painting on masonite panels back in the day, and I would just throw the damn thing in the corner. Wow! It was, wow! And you know, fortunately, I was in a studio back then where it could take the <laughs> take the harm. But now, once I go through my whole head, I get it all figured out ahead ahead of time. In other words, it's like it's to me. We've talked about this. I think observation and analysis. It's a, it's a scientific approach. I observe. As I'm laying the scene out, I'm observing. I put myself there, and I'm, I'm saying, "What's the?" Once I come up with the composition, okay, I'm there. I'm in this space now, and okay, once I get the composition set up, I'm not really I'm kind. I am kind of concerned about light, but really mainly where the positioning of these objects are within the picture plane, you know. But then, as I move into it, I'm analyzing and thinking and figuring all my light sources all out. So by the time I actually come to to the palette mixing the paint up, I pretty much have got it worked all out. Yes. Okay. So it's just, it's now it's like I, I go through my values and mix all my highlight to the shadow, highlight to the shadow and all the different colors and kept keep, you know, like we went through this last week, right? There's this yep. fire color, which I'm still, it's still the same paint because I keep it in a airtight container and spray it down with water and it stays working, you know? I don't know if that's a long answer to something or whether it was an answer at all. I don't even know. Was it? Yes. No, you're, you are answering the question. Uh, and so to, I, I want to, I want to um, uh, go back to that a, a little bit more. Sorry okay. to harp on this. I just, I think yeah. that, um, your, your reasoning and logic uh, of, of why you, and why you're insistent on doing it the way you're doing it can be helpful uh, to a lot of people uh, checking All in right. on this. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if you so okay, the the scythe doesn't light up, right? And but you but you have to make it brighter to make her uh, to appear brighter on that page or to, to get that that flesh to read the uh, that pale white color. Right. Yep. And you, and you just amped it up. Yeah, would if looking at the picture plane itself in that case, would you know that the lighting scenario doesn't work? Does that question make sense to you? Not quite. You got to go back okay. over it. Again. So if you didn't light it up with the scythe, right? right? And you were going with that that blue dome light. Yeah, and and you're like, okay, yeah, with how I have the lighting set. I know that it would it's too blue, but I I have to I have to increase her value up to make it 
uh, read is white. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you just you just did it with without creating that uh, that tertiary light source, you know, that right in that front here. of you. Yeah. Yeah. And you just did it. Yeah. Right. Because, you know, we're not dealing with a real light. <laughs> it's just right, it's exactly. a, it's a yeah, painting uh -huh. of, of a light. Would you then, would you look at the image and it would just, it it wouldn't look right to you? It wouldn't feel right to you? Uh, yeah, because I, I wouldn't understand it. I wouldn't feel right because I don't know what the hell's going on. You know what I'm saying? It, it probably, look, at, yeah. I, I could have amped up the blue. I mean, even lightened up the blue. I mean, it wasn't like the blue light was wrong. I mean, it was accurate according to the setup that Into I your had. scenario. Into right. it, that initial scenario. And I could have painted it all in like that. The simple fact of the matter was she would have been too dark. Not only too blue, but too dark. And and I, you know, in fact, that I was kind of like planning on that. That was my head. She was going to be darker with the edge light being stronger. And it just, it, it, it didn't have, didn't have it. I mean, it just didn't work. It just wasn't there i mean i i could have painted the whole picture off and it would have been it would have looked right because it's i would have stuck to the lighting setup which i had all figured out but it wouldn't yep. be what gene came back and said no she's got a pure white it, that when you look at lady death and you want to know that she's white you know the skin is white it's pure white yep Th that was her you know and i agreed with that so, so yeah, it's staying it's staying true to uh, into that comic feel of yeah the color of the the true color of the character, which is what I've done a lot of Tim and I both did when we did the Marvel masterpieces set. We would light the figures, the models up that posed for the bodybuilders and whatever the women and everything, all with white lights. And then when we started to paint, you know, I never, I generally don't paint, use colored lights on the models that that we invent. You know, when we start to paint. But we'd always light a key light, put a key light like this key light. It's a key light that would be show the true color of the character, the costume. Mm -hmm. but for the most part, sometimes we wouldn't, but for the most part, we would do that. Then rim light it. Or you could always do this rim lighting to get different colored lights. And then, of course, like some of the Marvel stuff, interior shots, particularly where you've got build structures and machinery and glowing lights and and all this stuff going on, you could you could put any color of light you want. Fill light, backlight, edge light, rim light, but more or less trying to keep a key light on the character, you know, back then. Even though some of them, like I say, I repeat again, we didn't. And I'm saying I wouldn't always do that. I mean, I would, you know, light it uh, uh, so that it wasn't the true color of the costume for whatever reason. I mean, there would be a reason behind that, you know. But mm -hmm. so, like so. Or what the hell? You know? So um, So you light up the scythe to justify the lighting scenario to to ensure that the the, the essence of the comic book version of that character comes the, through and comes to life. Right. right. Exactly. And that's just a strictly a personal choice. There's nothing right or wrong about any of that. That's just a choice, you know? Well, it's how your brain works and thinks of the art making process. Is there anybody in there? <laughs> so uh, someone asked before, did, did she have a cape on before? She did. And you can and see, you I, 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 I planned it with the cape and I thought, and then I just painted the, the, this, I had it transferred that way onto the, to the canvas. And then I painted this all in. I'm saying, what the hell? I mean, I won't get any of this rim light. The cape will block off all you the rim lights, okay. in, 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 which is what I totally depend on to have that figure read and be, you know, so I just, yes. boom. And she, you know, again, I, I went back to the character and did a lot of looking at the, the various, she's with cape, without cape, doesn't really matter, you know? Yeah. But yeah, you would have lost the, uh, the rim light, which would have killed the silhouette, yeah. correct? Yeah, totally. You're thinking... She's going to, this, there's a cape, which is red, blood red inside the cape and black on the outside. But that red cape would get, get, get to be this value here. See? Mm -hmm. Inside the cape. And then the body goes around and that gets darker around. So the values would merge and you'd lose the whole silhouette of the figure. 
and and I think that's what's critical. I think in figures of this nature, the silhouette should be good. I remember learning that from when I was, when I was totally involved, hung up on animation as a kid, and reading stuff in books or maybe Preston Blair in his animation book that he did that your drawings of the figure and it, all its key action points should read in silhouette. You should be able to block the whole figure out and have it still understand what the story is of that figure. And I yeah. kind of like, that's always stuck there in my head to try to make the, if you block this, you know, silhouette or all black, you would still get the gist of what the hell was going on with the figure. Yeah. You know, things that's aren't superimposed or closed in on each other. You know what I'm saying? Well, the silhouette in general will really can design. It can dictate the personality of the character as well. Completely. I'm not, I'm not talking just on the pose, but like you know, is it big and bulky? Is it sleek and smooth? Yeah. Like what's what's going on in that silhouette? And, and, and you've seen probably some film, old films, new films, whatever, of silhouette animation, where where the, yes. the figures would just be completely elevated, flat. They're incredible fantastic look the look of that the feel of that you know so there she is contemplating a skull and the, and the reason i started this you know she's been in a million poses i look i and i say well what the hell uh, alas poor york i knew him well kind of like shakespearean thing you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> well i mean it, there's there's down here there's a whole bunch of skeletons and everything you know Right. Yeah, someone's saying that there's so many skulls going on. Gene yeah. must love it. Uh, Steve Bunn. He's also asking, do you did you uh, do you use a real model for uh, death? Yeah. You know, you you, you get a you, yeah yep. I first drew the figure out of my head. I got the pull, which is what I always do. I define the whole figure in a detailed drawing, the one that we showed last week, and define the figure, and then get the model. This way, I have worked it at a distance. My friend Mark Romanowski got he had a girl that he had posed for Wonder Woman, and he suggested if he, if I you know I said yeah yeah Mark so he called her she came over to the house and that was the first for me because I was Gene and I were working with Mark and and uh, over the phone as he was you know over the visual over the electric thing here okay. and <laughs> <laughs> the electric thing and. We were working it that way from a distance. I said, no, 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 okay, no, get this, and, you know, give them, give them the directive, and, and it worked out. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah, making things work in uh, in the days of COVID. Yes. Right? Keeping everybody safe, but still getting the uh, the stuff that you need to get done. Getting it done. So, so yeah, someone else makes a comment that, uh, you know, the high heels are the perfect shoes for running over mountains and flames. Absolutely. Skulls. You have to have those to do that. They dig in well, you know what I'm saying? Right. Gives you a good yeah. push to get, you know. I mean, yeah. if it's true, too. I mean, if you're climbing a rocky mountain, those heels are going to be helpful, aren't they, to get into small crevices and stuff? They they get stuck in small crevices and help you to trip. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> well, it's most a riot. people climbing and stuff, you're climbing on the front of your foot anyway. But, you know, you know that's... Well, it's you know, you would know. You've probably done it. You right? I'm sure you've climbed, haven't you, Keith? Yeah, I, I climb in high heels all the time, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, with with that comment, you know, and and you know, yeah, high heels are probably not the ideal fighting. No, but uh, shoe pr foot protection. No, but it helps uh, the appearance of the character. It does. So. You know, that character, you know. Don't fight City Hall. Come on. You know, she is supposed to obviously have a sex appeal to her. Obviously. You know, and uh, so it's. Well, it, it, that's comics, isn't it? I mean, they, don't they all have sex appeal? I mean, from the beginning, you're, you're drawing not only women, but men in skin tight clothes. I mean, come on. Skin tight clothes and big giant muscles and oh, you're going the, for the the ideal form. Exactly. Well, the okay. ideal in this of the, which the ancient Greeks defined that so-called ideal, right? Yes. 
And I think most illustrators, at least the ones that I, you know, grew up on, stick to those proportions. It's like, I, I measure, I'll measure it. It's like, she's eight heads tall. A head, a head to the middle of the breast, a head to the middle of the torso, head to the crotch, and then head, four heads down to the heel. Eight heads tall, which is a kind of a standard. Yes. Yeah, and then some people... For this kind of girl, you know what I mean? A pin up, I do yeah. pin ups and stuff. It, you know, then you go into the nine heads tall, uh, you know, or whatever. You do anything you want, actually. But see, there's no writer. Like I say again, it's a choice. That's all. Yeah, it, seems to work. Uh, it has it has worked for a very long time. Yeah, and across uh, multiple genres and Century. artistic, uh, you know, mediums. And Adrian I, Wagner wants to see you paint me in high heels, climbing over a mountain of skulls. <laughs> that was <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that'll that'll be that'll be a trip. Uh, but you have to yeah. have extra wide ones. I have I have really wide flat feet. Yeah, so they have to be boat high heels. Maybe maybe. And, uh, I wouldn't advise people trying it now, Keith. I mean, some people are going to say, oh, they're talking about we should go out and climb mountains in high heels. Let's try it and see. No, no, no. Don't try it. <laughs> I'll try it at home. And to uh, to respond to David uh, Opry over there, he said that that's a great tribute to uh, Brian Polito, who was, I believe, the creator of that character. Good. Well, I believe so. I hope I'm not mistaken on that, but I, um, I believe Brian Again. passed away. Or maybe he was not, maybe not the creator of the character, but he was one of the artists yeah. on that on that character. Sorry, it's been some years. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know more than I do on those comics. So uh, yeah, I apologize if I'm I'm getting that inf information uh, incorrect, but I, I believe he passed away. Well, I mean, again, this is this is not a job. This is a uh, this is a commission from a gentleman who asked me to paint this picture. Not this picture, but a picture of Lady Death. And then we, we talked over the phone, and I came up with this a particular setup like this, you know, that is to say, medieval and her first incarnation. He liked the original costume, or yep. Whatever you want to call it. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. lack thereof. A lack thereof costume. Right, lack thereof. Well, you know, I don't think you have it painted in yet, but the, the little skull on the uh, on the underwear will... Uh... Oh, here? Yeah, there's here, 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 yeah. here are skulls. And I find it interesting, no, there too. You go. That makes it a costume, right? There's a costume. I mean, you know, what the hell? It's, yep. a, it's a costume. What do you want? Rob Evans says he misses you and Gene. Oh, Rob, how are you, man? Miss you, too. Big time. <laughs> so now, now, see, all you people, now, now there's people watching me paint. And I go in and out of. In and out of uh, anxiety. Yeah. Well, I think when you're painting, this is a tough thing to paint, the figure, a female figure. It still is very demanding, you know. I agree. I think, you know, yep. fire is easier. You know, you're, you're not stuck to any shape. Here you're stuck to a shape. You make a little move that's off, especially in the face, ah, the whole thing is lost. Oh, it's, if yeah. you're painting flames, nobody knows. It, it takes all abstract shapes, so it doesn't, you know. And who the hell knows about these towers? They can be fat, squat, short, tall, doesn't matter. This is very, what, demanding, precise. You have to be. It takes uh, more concentration of your uh, your mental fortitude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Is it is it okay then if I still I continue to ask you questions and, and talk? By to all you means, by uh, Keith. Our painting in those that, smaller that, no, areas. That, yeah. 
so um that threw me off now i gotta think of what that has yep. so the uh we talked about the scythe and lighting that up as some form of magic and the skulls um see see you know this you get this nice purpley light purple on this black stuff and you get the edge light here it gives it a you know yes rounded feeling right i like the flat stuff too man we i think we talked about that last week the illustrators of the 50s guys like al parker and and all those guys who would flatten everything out their design was fantastic well, it's always about design though the whole damn thing is a design hair is always a i've always i always have this a struggle with hair you know, you got to design that you just can't do a bunch of hairs you have to think of a big mass shape you know okay. design that shape as though it's a solid structure and then loosen it up and i and i know that i'll try to keep it like broad and like that and then i'll screw it up and ah oh, crap and i'll have to wipe it out again okay. then i go back and it's like whew, try to get it you know oh that's not right wipe it out again because I, I, I don't, the initial strokes, I don't want to be like this yet. I want to get to maybe a few of those, but I want the main stroke to be big, you know. So, so that it has you, this. You do, the, you do that initial block of the hair. You keep that initial block loose? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Just very loose. Just to get the, okay. the shape of it and the highlights on it, you know. And that takes over and over. And when you're, I remember, the hope is to get it look not not too mannered you know what I'm, you know really mannered and worked on but to keep it looking kind of sp spontaneous to some degree i don't know whether I, how much i succeed in that but john singer gotcha. sergeant was a master at that yeah sergeant and he would yep. struggle with that he would try to get that hair whoosh, sweep and ah go back and look at it he worked in oil and scrape it off and he keeps struggling to get over and over and over again to get a spontaneous look. <laughs> Even though it was very studied, but yet, you know what I mean? You're, you're, you're struggling with these two ends, you know? Yeah. So, now I, I, saw, I have a question uh, then in, in regards to that, you know, because I know you get very, you're very hung up with the lighting and the lighting has to be uh, true to nature. Yeah, right. That's, that's the effort. Right. That's that's, that's the, the that's the effort. Now with the hair, which would be affected by the wind. Yeah. Do you feel the same necessity to calculate the wind? Yeah, yeah. You want movement, like you know, when you look at lo lots of Lady Death and lots of let's be honest about superhero comic stuff, whew, the, the the hair is whew, all over the place. I did I I do some initial sketches like that that did not work with this setup. I mean, she's here studying the skull, and she's in this this field of skulls and bones and everything. And I wanted a more vertical feeling to it. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yes. Yet still enough enough wisps in it to give it movement. You know, and, and everything's about movement, right? It's like you're painting all this stuff, and it's like. And again, whether or not I'm successful or not is arguable, I suppose. It's all about movement. How do the how do clouds roll and move? You know, mm -hmm. how do how does fire move? So you're trying to get that. Yes. To make it look alive. Yeah. Naturalistic. But the the. The 100% scientific approach to how that hair would be affected by the wind conditions in that very moment isn't necessarily as important to you as the, the that lighting scenario. The lighting scenario and the way it looks. Does that make does the, does, does that make sense? Yeah. To you, like what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Anyway, I got to get some color out here. You know, like Tupperware containers. Yeah. We can go on talking. Now, okay, so 
now you you use the scythe to light her up and you is that going to go in or has it already gone in to uh, hit those skulls more to bring those skulls I, I, I yeah no I have I, I've used this light source which is to say the edge of the light where it starts to get mm -hmm. moves into the blue it goes through purple goes to, it goes from white at the core straight white out of the tube you know titanium white yep. to white and cad cadmium yellow medium just a tint that's what these highlights are here yeah that cadmium yellow medium into the titanium white but it's a tint it's like it the white's at the top of the list and then you know the the value structure and then that color of yellow is just a tiny bit darker and so that it 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 is it never gets as bright as a light source you know what i'm saying yep. and i forgot what the hell answer what, what i was trying to answer oh yeah <laughs> well, down here about down here balls, right? okay yeah so that goes through a series of values into the darker zone where it starts to go into that's ultramarine blue and white because that's what the sky is and i just kind of that's a unity color all that ultramarine yep. white so then i i start to put a little bit of this purpley stuff down onto the top of the skulls and onto this okay. rock down here because this is a little bit lighter than it was last week all these little highlights that i'll probably crank up a little more is it's underneath okay. down here you see what i'm saying in this zone get it yep. a little bit lighter i don't want it to get too bright because i want to keep it all up here and then have it dissipate which it would do naturalistically an object moves further away from the light it, it, it gets dark you know it isn't as bright as an object close to the light you know all that no. stuff's in your head yeah I, i'm going head. to i'm going to call back to a, a question again with those skulls um because i know that we have a couple of the same people that were watching last week and and asking um we were talking about the uh the local color of the skull coming into play in the color mixture even though it doesn't uh necessarily show up that yeah that yep. yellow yep. color so as you're hitting it with that whiter light of the side uh the side is that local color coming into play even more or no is no now you're stuck you're only putting the light source color of the light source on it got you thank you because if you have an object here well, where the hell is an object an object yep the final highlights on any of this stuff is the color of the light yep you have the true color of the object then you're moving towards the highlight the light value which is moving towards the color of the light source then if you get the final highlights they're the color of the light source whatever that color is got you you ask many questions that's what we're here about right that's what we're here for yes so yeah we got a bunch of people uh you know watching if anybody else has any other questions that they would like to ask greg or any comments anything like that to um about this painting or whatever please feel free to ask and chime in and space art by christopher says this is a master class in illustration thank you greg oh well, I'm glad. well you know it's cool that people get something i'm glad of that you know i get something out of it too, talking yeah it's the whole the whole point of this right is that it is the point of it yes it is able to interact with the uh, people that like your stuff Yep. Keith, asking Waylon is actually watching this week. Ah. The gentleman that Greg is doing this for. Well, ask him. Yeah. Oh. Waylon, tell Waylon, me what. Waylon, are you there? Waylon, answer. <laughs> what do you think so far? Is is it satisfactory? <laughs> I guess that's the question. Oh, yeah. Well, Waylon is definitely here because he's the one who uh, noticed that the cape was gone. <laughs> so, ah. ah. Ask Waylon. Waylon, is that okay with you that the cape, cape was gone? Cape, well, <laughs> Can you, can you, we can see her better, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to respond to you, Dean. Uh, you know, Dean says it sounds so simple when it's broken down clearly. Yeah, that's, uh, that's in essence, what makes a, a great teacher or Greg is very good at teaching this stuff is, you know, I mean, as well as, as painting it, cause he's able to break it down into very um, base terms and very simplified 
uh, mechanics. Now, whether you're able to take what he says and reapply it onto a canvas yourself is well, uh, uh, yeah, is a whole well, other issue. But yeah, you're able to break things down in a way that everyone can understand and comprehend, and and that's a, it's a rare thing for people to be able to do that. I, I, I taught at Joe Kubert school for several years, and that was quite simple, simple, quite simple. And I never taught before. And to me, it's, it's about two things when you're teaching. Pass along the information that you have in the clearest manner you possibly can and to inspire. That's the two to me. That was always what it was about. And I, and I really got it clearly spoken. And I think that what was helpful about that is, I think we've talked about that in the past, is working with a twin brother all, all those years. I was able to, we were, our, our mixing of our values needed to be a very scientific approach from, from a light source color highlight to light source color shadow. And then what, how many, seven piles of paint that cover that, that were very simply understandable between the two of us, you know? I think that was helpful. So yeah, uh, Wayland's chiming in, and he says he thinks it looks amazing. Very good, thank oh, you. Oh, very happy about that. that. I'm, 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 I'm so glad. Got a, got a question. Got a question for you, Greg? Uh, are you ever sad to see a painting uh, go? Like when you finish something and then uh, you ship it off to the person? Do you, does you ever get sad about uh, losing a painting? <laughs> not losing it, but letting Never. it go. Well, that's not true. Well, you weren't mean? very happy. When, you you weren't very happy when I sold the Evil Queen. Well, you're right. <laughs> I'm always right. <laughs> but I mean, generally no, because I know that's what I'm doing it for, and that's what I've made my living off of, illustrating, for, you know, since 1958, doing art for a project, and then it's handed in or handed over or given over, and that's that. That's what, that's what I do. Boom. Then there are certain ones that I want to keep that I'll never sell, like the, the the painting, that nightmare painting, dream painting that I did that Black Sabbath used on their Mob Rules album cover. I won't sell that. That's a hyper-personal thing to me, and I, and I, I, I won't sell that. You know? Keith, tell them what my motto is. Yep. Uh, Gene's, Gene's <laughs> motto is that everything is for sale except for the artist. And the artist we rent by the hour. <laughs> that, that sounds like it could be something else. Oh, that <laughs> sounds like it could be. So, you know, for from my perspective on that, you know, Greg, you're you're very fortunate in a lot of ways that most of the stuff that you're working on is already sold before you start working on it you know yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, hey you have you have a job here do the job yeah yeah as opposed to coming at it from uh the place of i'm doing a personal piece of art right that i'm wrapped up in emotionally uh and and then and then letting it go two different worlds two completely different First, worlds you know yeah. and you know gene standing in the background there gene and i we were talking the other day, what, what was the painting that just sold recently, Gene? That we were both like, ah, uh, you know. Oh, that the, one the a little bigger. oh, the uh, uh, creature from a black lagoon. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, which is hanging know, in, so. which is hanging in the house because it's on a one-year layaway. So I get to, I get to look at it for one more year, and then I get to pack it up and ship it to its new home. Yeah. And yeah, and then it's gone. So. Yeah, uh, okay. We'll get a, another good question here, Greg. It's uh, from Ted. He, his comment is about digital painting. He said, you know, it's a lot of people do digital painting. He personally prefers um, real, real paintings, you know, the traditional paintings. As to him, they feel more organic. Um, okay. I know, I know that you don't do digital art, Greg. No. Nope. But... Uh, what are your thoughts on it as far as a an art consumer, someone who looks at art? Uh, do you have thoughts on digital art? I mean, the, most of the, 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 the stuff I've seen that's digital that people do is freaking incredible. <laughs> <laughs> it fucking blows me away. 
I mean, I don't give a shit what the, what the technique or t- is. I, it, it blows me away. I don't know what the hell to say. I mean, and you that's got, either that's you got to realize that Greg, you know, uses a computer for Google and a few other things, but he doesn't use Photoshop, so he doesn't even understand the, the technique of doing art digitally, and he doesn't want to, which is perfectly fine. But I mean, we have gone to shows where. There are 200 digital artists, and their work is absolutely fabulous. But I always ask the really, really good ones if they can do that with a brush. When they say yes, I say, why aren't you? And they should. They should do it both ways, in my opinion. And that's just an agency opinion. You know, the digital artist fabulous is great. It's pixels. You know, and, and someday, and I know all about, you know, the world of NFTs and yada, 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 and all that's happening now in the digital world. I think that's fabulous for them. I really do. Um, but it's nice to hang it on a wall and have it, you know, have somebody walk in your home and go, oh, my God, what an amazing painting. How did you do that? You know, it's, do both. Don't do one. Do both. If you have yeah, story, I mean, you're primarily responsible for me getting back into uh, traditional media. Yay. You know, <laughs> uh, Good for you know, me. It's like, you, know, you know, and I, I found... Um, that get again getting back in traditional doing some of the stuff that i had done digitally uh, i personally am now preferring it in the traditional form and applying the traditional paint and and just the the actual physical feel of of creating it again yeah i I mean 20 years i was doing digital art you know just and i still do it with you know doing advertising it's it's all digital and it makes zero sense to do that traditionally anymore. Like sure, well, I can see that. For less sure. than zero cents. Right. <laughs> yeah, know? but Keith, but, there's another there's another but, side to it. There's a totally other side to it. For example, you recently painted, and I and I know that the people that are on here are are watching Greg diligently paint Lady Death over here. But you recently painted, if I'm not mistaken, a, a chicken or a rooster. I don't know which one it was. A okay. Hand. Yes. A hen. Okay, for your wife, uh, as yep. a gift, and it was it was one of her hens that was killed by a predator. Okay, and That's that was correct. really super important to her that you took the time, the energy, the patience, and the love to paint that chicken for her, as opposed to, honey, I printed a photo. Yes. Big yep. difference. Big difference. Yep. Yeah. The painting is more real than the photo for her. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, so Waylon does ask, uh, do you, do you enjoy doing lady death? Um, uh, how much do you enjoy doing lady death? Like that kind of character, as opposed to a more traditional, uh, like Marvel or DC character. Do you have any enjoyment difference between like something like that? Or versus like a Cyclops or a Wolverine or anything. Oh yeah, this is much. I, I like this better. First of all, you know, so it's a. It's a, it's a I think for I think I think Whalen for obvious reasons. I mean, you know what I'm saying. I love to paint all kinds of characters. I, I, you name one, I I love to paint. Period. People, old, young, beautiful, not so beautiful. I mean, I just love to paint. But I mean, asking it that way, yeah. I mean, come on. You know, uh, I I don't know if people are going to get pissed off at me, but she's a hot chick. What the hell? God. That's a fact, Jack. I mean, you know, this is as simple as that. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's politically incorrect to say. I'm sure it's politically incorrect. But that's what she is. She's beautiful. She's I mean, beautiful. And, and that's, that's, and she's an enigmatic character, and she's on an edge. She's very edgy, and she's, you know, I like I say again, I'm stupid about a lot of, Marvel uh, comic book characters these days, right? And I researched this when Whalen commissioned me because I knew the, of the character. She was in the back of my head somewhere. And but when you read that history, I mean, this whole apocalyptic struggle in the Middle Ages and going to hell and and battling Satan. <laughs> I mean, it's like very appealing. I love that kind of. It's very biblical. Biblical, exaggerated, <laughs> mythological, over the top drama. It's a, it's very entertaining and very appealing to me. It provides great imagery, you know. Yeah. 
So that, it, yeah, in a nutshell, yeah, I enjoy this very much. Well, well and I'll, I'll ask you a question. If you were painting and you had a choice, you were going to either <laughs> paint Lady Death or Darth Vader, which would you prefer? I and think he he, he already chimed in on the on the comments that he prefers characters like Lady Death over Marvel as okay, well. Okay, well I can't yeah. see the comments, Keith. I I yeah. don't have that I don't have that access on this screen. So I mean, really, if, if a guy and I mean Greg's eighty two, but he's not dead from the neck down. So you know, <laughs> if if he's got to paint, you know, a, a plastic helmet with some guy with a low voice and a and a big black cape, and mostly it's black with a little edge light, as opposed to this beautiful woman. That this is not even a contest for him. No, but I do love to paint those kinds yes, of characters. Yes, you do. I, but again, like it's I said, not a contest between you I, two. I like painting fire. I like painting smoke. I like painting clouds. I like painting rocks. I like to paint it all. But there, we've answered that question. There right? you go. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark, Mark Price, uh, two things. One to answer you, Mark, that uh, I know you said you tuned in late. But after these are over, we upload them to YouTube so that anybody can watch it anytime so you could start over at the, at the very beginning if you would like um and then he wants to know have you ever taken anatomy classes uh oh. no i mean well i went to six months of art school I, I i always wanted to be i wanted to be a disney animator when i was a kid and all the way up through high school and i wrote letters to disney asking what i needed to do to apply for an animator position yes, and, and they said go to a school that focuses on uh life drawing perspective and anatomy and in that school i had uh, an anatomy class but it was like a skeleton and you draw from the skeleton well tell, tell the story about the professor with the underwear love that. oh that was another one this is well this is anatomy is it because we had a life drawing class you know and i was like this naive kid embarrassed because i walked into this room filled with people and there's this naked girl up on the stage and it was like, you know, you kind of like, oh, I'm going to be a professional. I'm not going to even look at her until I set up my thing. You keep your head down, go into the corner, set up my drawing pad. Let look up and start to draw right away. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And in any event, one of the sessions, Mr. Rich, he was the, he was fantastic. He'd come over and give you directives. He'd kind of, blah, 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 blah. and then he'd go in a corner and sleep, more or less, because he was pretty old. And, you know, he was real great. He had this kind of like Einstein hair and mustache and always wore a pinstripe suit, you know, like a double-breasted pinstripe suit from the 40s. And he'd yeah. sit there in the corner. And you'd hear him. And you're sketching, sketching. And there'd be painters in the class. And this one girl, she was posing, and Mr. Rich was asleep. And her break came. You know, the models a certain, you know, length of time up, up there on the stage. And she got down off the stage, put her robe on. Generally, what the girls would do when they were girls and guys, you know, they had guy models too. But when the girls would come around, they'd look at all the guys over there uh, at their work and try to con them out of their drawings. <laughs> and they would do that <laughs> in a very obvious manner, you know, with the very loosely draped <laughs> robe. And in any event, this is one girl. She gets back, she goes back into the little dressing room area, comes back out. Now she's wearing red panties. And she was nude, you know, for the whole, they're all nude models. And she's wearing red panties. Mr. Rich was asleep for all. He's snoring all the while. And suddenly, you know, I'm drawing away. And she goes up, she's posing. And suddenly I hear Mr. Rich, he wakes up. He says, whoa, whoa, what's, what is that? Take those off. That's indecent. Which hit me like the panties <laughs> made the pose indecent. Which I kind of, you know, like, it, it sort of makes sense in a way, you know? That's the distinction, I guess, pin up in life drawing, you know, or something. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, take those that's, off. That's indecent. It's very funny <laughs> when you retell the story. <laughs> But yeah, you know, I can, I can, I can get it. I can yeah, see that. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, now, also though, uh, with your with life drawing, you continued, at, you know, into your professional career. You didn't just stop with that six month program. Like you and Boris and some other guys 
Oh, yeah. Set up your own life drawing classes. Right? Absolutely. And we get models, pay for the models, they'd come in, we sit around, but I got, I still have the, the sketch pads here. And we would, we would work from life. And then when I wasn't doing that, I, I, I went to some other life drawing setups in the 70s by myself at a local school where there was a teacher. And I just wanted to draw from life and see, and stay at that. Because there's a whole different thing that happens working from life as opposed to working from photos, you know? Yes. It, it's, it's, it's a completely different world. Anyway. Now, now, in what way do you feel that it's a completely different world? Uh, I don't know. Stuff happens in your drawing. I think you're, I know for me, I'm more rapid. I'm trying to get it down because I know it's, there's a tension and, and, and with the model. They're posing and you're feeling that kind of anxiety feeling of, I got to get this down fast. Well, then a life class too, in this particular one at this particular art school, I went to Meinzinger's art school. You know, you had 10 second pose, 15 second pose, 30 second pose, minute pose. You know, you had these timing things. And I think doing that it, from life, especially you're, you're physically seeing things in a different manner than you are with a photograph. I think you're more relaxed with a photograph, you know, much more relaxed. Maybe that takes away the edge okay. that you get from life drawing. Do you know what I'm saying? You can see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, I don't know exactly how to explain it. It's not, I know that's now, not very clear. I know, I know you, just for practicality, you use photographs uh, almost exclusively. You know, you're, yeah. not drawing, you're not drawing Lady Death from a model nope. standing over there next to you. God, I can't imagine those days when, when artists had to do that, as illustrators had to do that. You gotta, you know, you look at Rockwell stuff, right? Or any of them. You got a model sitting there, standing there, holding a running pose. You had to get your knee up on a box in a running pose and stay there. It, it's like I, I would do that certain times. I mean, there was I can start I start it isn't the only the model that's sweating and suffering. You're sweating and suffering. It's the artist. There's a there's a real what? kind of anxious thing going on there. I can't imagine that. Having to illustrate that way every day, you know? Yeah. You know, Keith, However, there's a very there's a very interesting thing about this that uh, I don't think most people would even think about. Um, you know, because before the pandemic, we always had the models come here. I would pick the models for Greg. I'd, I, you know, he'd hand me a sketch and I'd find the right girl that, that matched what he wanted to paint okay um but from my perspective not as his agent but as his wife mm -hmm. i i think you got to really get that if we had these girls in here live continuously that would be a problem <laughs> that would just be a problem Keith. you know i love all the models we use and honestly you know i'm getting older they're not and really it's you know so okay take your pictures put the lights on let's you know and let's go you know shoot for four hours they go home you got your your photos so i mean i'm just throwing that out in case anyone's interested <laughs> however it, it is worthwhile to do those uh life classes if you can and oh, absolutely. when you can oh, because absolutely. there is something about seeing the live you could appreciate the the volume of the figure you know with the lighting hitting the figure yep. um, in a way in in a real world scenario that doesn't necessarily come across in yeah, that, it, that photo or the print of the photo it, it's a flat 2d thing you, you don't see dimensionality you're you're yeah. seeing it in your head, your in your mind, but you're not seeing it physically with your eyes. In that live case, you are. You're seeing dimensionality, and also you're seeing colors if you're painting that you don't see in a photograph. You're seeing subtleties that you can't see. In a photograph. If that's what you're after, is to copy that subtlety. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, got uh, so, yeah, Mark. Christ again chiming in apparently in uh when he was in art school they had a male model who uh 
perhaps had the most embarrassing thing that could happen to a guy in front of a group of people while he's naked. Yeah. I could imagine. I never had that. Was he embarrassed or was he happy, Mark? <laughs> uh, he says uh, he, he took his break, covered himself up, and then, uh, well, I mean, oh. his hands. <laughs> Good God. That's what happens. Poor boy. Poor boy. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. Moving, Moving on. on. Moving Alexander on. Next. Says, Greg, you taught him about backlighting. Thank you very much. Oh, that's a that's a good one. Backlighting is fantastic. Go look at, you know, whoops, get too much white there. Uh, this man is constantly covered in paint, no matter what. Someone did ask how Greg managed to get paint on his back. Oh, I don't know. Ask him how he manages it to get on the refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> That's easy. That's easy. That's right. Okay, so backlighting. You're going to tell us about backlighting, Greg. Backlighting is good. It, 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 it makes the figure stand out. It, it also hopefully gives it a dimensionality. So, you, you know, it's not if you were just running that flat, which I've done, and you do, and it looks great. Depends on the situation. They're not always backlighting, but in this kind of thing, it's well, it's dramatic too. There's a drama to it, right? Mm -hmm. That that increases the what increases the what the uh, intensity the intensity of the setup, the scene, the what the hell the happened. overall drama, right? You, you said yeah. the drama it increases the drama. Yeah, right. Backlighting, depending on the color of the light you're using, too, Keith. Uh, backlighting in low light is fabulous for evil scenes. Vampire scenes, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, this this kind of stuff. You know, you, you're using red. If you use a low light, and then you get those huge, intense shadows, you know, under the chin and the face. It gets really evil. So it's the direction of the lighting that will create that. Okay. I have, I'm going to ask you one more question about lighting, but to answer Alexander Devonport's question, Greg doesn't use any mediums with his acrylics. He only uses water. Just water. I spray it down with this plant mister to keep over here it's on, on these aluminum sheets that i just spray it down while i paint to keep it wet and have working. you shown them your aluminum sheets yeah yeah okay yeah and uh just to answer alexander a little bit further uh when greg had mentioned that when he tried to use extending medium it altered the texture of the paint itself yeah uh, i didn't like that he just couldn't get used to it so he switched back to just just water it was it was kind of gummy and you know i if you get used to that i mean you know it'd be fine but i didn't i didn't feel like get, trying to get used to it this was working fine for me so what the hell you know okay so i have uh, i have a question about lighting and lighting setups right uh -huh. you know we've been we've been talking about that a lot and really you know lighting is one of the predominant features of your work right um when you set up the lighting scenario, are you coming at it from any particular angle or do you feel that light can just, it can work from any angle on the figure? No. Does that it, question it, make sense? Yeah, no, the, the lighting, the angle of the light is about what the circumstance is that you're painting. What What's the scene? What's the setup? What's the story that's being told? Where are you and what's happening? And where's the light coming from? You know, now mm -hmm. take all that kind of stuff into account. And then you could also then enter the scene and positional light somewhere, especially with interior scenes, you know, or nighttime scenes. But if you're dealing with daylight and sunlight, you, you could, you have various choices. You can like, you can, the sunlight can be coming from the top. It can come from the front, becoming, it can be coming low. Depends on what you're after, you know, what mood are you after? What story you're telling? So yeah, angle of light is always an issue and where it's coming from and what color it is. Yeah. Are there are there any angles to the light that you try to avoid? Uh, Good question. Well, well, yeah, I mean, not an, yeah, angle, positioning of lights. Positioning yes. of lights. Like this key light on her and these back lights and the, the lights on the photos, you know, from the back. Now, if you were to bring these, get the yellow light around the sides more and in that light is still on the figure, it'll turn to mush. 
if you keep it further around the back, it gets very clearly defined. It doesn't enter the white light source. You see what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. where it does enter the light white source, you know, you need to make some a new color, and you don't want that that happen necessarily, at least in this picture. You want to keep the light sources separate from each other. You know, here, 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 here. You know, you can light a scene up with four different positions of light on a figure, directly from the top, directly from the bottom. And I've done a lot of that with the superhero stuff, and from both sides. So you get four lights on the figure, you know? There's literally four lights here. There's one, two, three, four. There's four different positions of light on that figure. Plus then any bounced or ambient light, you see? This is bounced light here coming off of this rock here, bouncing back up, you know? So you get the reflected light, or I call it bounced light. Light hits an object and bounces back, you know? Yep. So now, the the purpose of the light, other than just making the character become visible in the picture plane, what what is the purpose? Uh, what is the light serving the picture? Telling the story. Is I mean, it, but you know, I mean, in in terms of positioning the lights yeah. right are, are um essentially what i'm getting at here is that is it creating volume are you able to see the volume of the character yeah the the, the way by where you position the yeah light? absolutely that, that's all part of it too yeah flat flatter lighting won't give you the volume it'll just be a flat thing but you you put like this presetta was great at that with the overhead light that he did almost yep. consistently Gives you those yes, cast yeah. downward shadows, and that really creates that solidity of that figure. You know. Yep. Yeah. Volume. Yeah, that's 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 a way to, to put it. Come on, people, ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> nice, Greg. What the hell? I'm just not sitting here like for the hour. I'm not just you know? sitting here painting. Come on. <laughs> It's talking for the sake of talking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we have Don't like skulls and tits are the three pillars of Greg's work. It's, it's pretty accurate. What's that? The, uh, so Dean 13 says lights, skulls, and tits are the three pillars of your work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. See you here. You put Is that this. what we're going to put on his tombstone? Yes. Oh, okay. I We have a good one here. Uh, and this will lead into something else and also uh, plays into some other people that are on this live stream with us right now. So, uh, so Ted, Beauvalet, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Uh, whenever he mixes a tune, he always has pictures coming into his mind. When you're painting... Uh, uh, he wonders if music ever inspires you or do you need a quiet environment? Oh, no, no, no. Music is critical. There, there, it depends. You know, no. I mean, when I'm, I think when I'm, I know when I'm, when I'm at my drawing board and I'm coming up with the initial sketch for an idea, you know, layout, say for this one, I don't want any sound at all. I just want me and my pencil and a piece of paper. Look you know? You can see. Yeah. Okay. Then, depending, I, I think if I'm trying to get it together and you're struggling, I don't want to hear any sound. But once I, once it goes clunk, you know, your setup goes clunk in your mind, ah, I, I know what I'm after. Then music is, is, is helpful for me. And I've always listened to music when I worked in that manner since I was young, you know. And that can be anything, you know, yeah, not, explain, not anything. Explain, explain the different kinds of music that you use. That you listen to during different phases of, of painting, right? Because uh, it, it changes. It, it, well, it, yeah, it, classical music, uh, you know, real, I mean, classical music, you know, Mozart, Beethoven, Franz Liszt, you know, like the Dante Symphony of Franz Liszt. That's great for this kind of thing. And I found that little section of it, you know, it's he, Liszt was really dramatic when he wrote, you know, mm -hmm. like here he writes one, the Dante Symphony, that's about the inferno you know and so something like that is fantastic 
then I, I'll then I'll listen to rock. I mean, I'll put on a what, what do you what do you, what, what's that station I listen to? Oh, I have uh, the uh, the Beatles know. station on Pandora. Yeah. Pandora, so you, there. Uh, uh, Pro, I, 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 you, you listen to Progol, Progol Harum. Harum, Progol Harum Radio. So they'll give me all that deep purple, you know, you know what I'm Nights saying? White satin, 27 times a day. <laughs> 27 times a day, too much of light noise. King Crimson, you know, Epitaph, you know, where you, you get into that nice, long, dramatic, progressive rock stuff. You know, I love that. Transavirian Orchestra, and you know, like Beethoven. 50s. Yeah, fifties music. So I mean, it'll be all over the place. Depends on what the hell it is, you know. Now, do you paint differently with different types of music? I have painted to the rhythm of the music when when it's intense. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll do that when I'm starting to block it in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, now, Keith, you... there's two reasons why there's no music on in the background right now because there's usually music on in the background in the studio. So mm -hmm. a because you're moderating this, but b because a bunch of the videos that uh, we have on our, our YouTube channel, I shot Greg painting years ago while he was in the studio with music. Just he had the damn radio on and they took the audio off. YouTube dropped yeah. the audio. So, yeah, the copyright infringement. Yeah, you got a lot of problems with that. So it yeah. didn't, they didn't in the beginning, but in the last no. few years they started doing that. So I, I, I get two questions for you, Greg, again, yeah. regarding music. Now, you know, you were talking about being in progress on something and then just, you know, the, the painting of the music, yeah, uh, dictating the, the brush strokes. But have you, when you're just, when you get up in the morning and you're drawing for yourself, right? Your, you know, your warm ups, your, yeah. your brain dumps or whatever. Do you ever turn on music and let that music inspire that creativity? Sometimes. Sometimes. A lot of the times late in the yeah, there's a whole different thing happening to me now. It has probably got no, no relationship to that, but with music on the rock stations, I'll click around, listen. I, 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 Gene started me off uh, some time ago on if I was to paint movie posters, if I was a commercial illustrator hired to paint the movie posters of the, as of the films that I loved when I was younger, and I painted three of them, the Creature, Creature from the Black Lagoon, uh, King, King Kong. Kong. I did a, a color comp of Nightmare Alley, the Tyrone Power film, the one that Guillermo del Toro apparently just quit. He, we did it. He's, he principally shot everything. I've been listening to sketching down my take on rock album covers. So I've got a whole stack. It's about this thick and enough. <laughs> and some of them are just pure. Oh, like, yeah. like, I give up. <laughs> you know, no, there, there's, she says she gave up. But they're really cool. <laughs> they're just simple, rough ideas. You know what I'm saying? Without the, the, that, the music of that album is inspiring the imagery. Yeah, the imagery. And it's like something, it'll be something very obvious. Some of the more obscure ones, like the Progo Harem's uh stuff which are very enigmatic are very interesting to do and uh when you're strange you know the doors one yes that that was a cool one i did a rough on that and i did that in the cabinet of dr caligari style if you've ever seen oh. that silent film yes yeah, everything yeah. It, well everything that, is strange that, that women are strange you're strange it's you know, it's all twisted drawing. It's like really, you know, a guy with a backpack coming into town with all the crooked buildings and everything. <laughs> that's I think that's one of my favorites there so far. So I, I do then, that. Yeah. That's well, fun. I'm also gonna I'm gonna throw in here, and this is just because, uh, you know, one of the things we've been working on is your your bio, and particularly hitting the TSO portion of your bio. Now. When you heard TSO for the first time, yeah, what well, happened then? Yeah, well, I mean, I was uh, Gene and I were wrapping Christmas presents, and we we go through a whole bunch of our music that we have, you know, Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby, what the hell ever, Nightmare, Nightmare Before Christmas, you know, album and all this stuff, 
you know, John Demmer and the Muppets Christmas. <laughs> Whatever, you know. And then I find this disc laying behind my disc play player. I go to change disc, put a new one up, and I look at it, I pick it up, and it's, it was in shrink wrap still. It's Trans-Siberian Orchestra. And I said, what the hell is that? Some Russian women's choir thing? Because that's what was big back then. This was like, how many years ago, Gene? 2003. 2002? 2003. 2002. And so I... 2002 Christmas. And so I, 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 I said, should we put this on? Nah, let's go back to Frank's and I, No, nah, no, nah, let's put it on. So I put it on. We're rapping. And it, boom, it, it's like, what the hell is this? You know, I didn't read the libretto. You could see there's a story of some kind. Especially when it gets to uh, the Old City Bar piece in that first Christmas album, Christmas Eve and Other Stories. And and, and the music is moving to rock into traditional classical mix. I mean, it's fantastic. We played it again, and it was like, whoa. And then I was had a studio with other people, and I walked over the next morning. I brought it in. I said, you guys, you're going to hear the best damn Christmas album ever. And I played it, and then another friend of mine, there's oh, buddy of mine just saw them at the Beacon Theater downtown New York. And so he, he gets, I said, really? So he put, he gets them on the speakerphone, and we're talking, and the guy's, oh, you got to see it live, lasers and, and pyro, and uh, it's a spectacular show. And I said, incredible. And then he said, have you heard their rock album, Beethoven's Last Night? And I said, no, what's what's that? He goes, it's a disc they did. They haven't done the show, but you can get it. So I went out and got it the next day. And it was like, holy mackerel. So I'm, I put that on. It blew my mind. And because, I mean, I love Beethoven. I've been a Beethoven fan since I was a kid. And his whole story, right, going deaf and everything is so, uh, it's a, one of the greatest dramas, you know, in, in, in art. And, and so the music was fantastic. So I'm listening to it. Gene, I didn't, didn't even play for Gene. See, I mean, I was playing at the, my other studio. I had a studio separate from the house. And so but what I would do is I'd come home from that studio at night come down here to the studio, Gene would go up to bed, and I would sit there, play the album, and start sketching. And I and I literally did this for three months. And I and I never worked this way. Ever I, I never worked this way. I I, I I always worked during the day. I never worked at nighttime. But I I come home from you know working on jobs, come here, eat, we'd sit around for a while, then she'd go up and I'd come down and I'd play the album and I swore I'd work till three o'clock in the morning and I and I normally never have done that ever. And literally three months go by and I, I literally come out of a stupor with a stack of art that's black and white sketches, color comps, roughs, pencil roughs, paint, watercolor, and show it to Jane. She says, What the hell is this? Explain, you know, play the music. And then, you know, at some point next day maybe I say should, do you think we, I get practical? Should we do something with this? And she said, well, well who is it? Like, I never even looked to see the, to see who did the music. I, I was just, the music was everything. So I look it up on the, on the album and Paul O'Neill and Paul O'Neill, blah, blah, blah. Jean says, okay, she gets the number, a number for me in New York City of a recording studio. And, and where the hell is that water? Is there water there, Jane? Water? Yeah, I need some water. My throat's getting dry. Oh, I, never mind. I got some. Okay. So I called this recording studio, phone of a voice answers, and I said, is Paul O'Neill there? And he says, no, he's not here today. And I give him my name and number, and I go back to this, my studio the next morning in the other studio, separate from the house here. The phone rings, and it's this voice comes on and said, is Greg Hildebrandt there? And I said, this is him. He said, this is Paul O'Neill. I can't believe you called me. So it's like he's been a fan since the Lord of the Rings stuff in the 70s. <laughs> so I were on the phone together. I said, you know, it became this, you're the man. No, you're the man. No, you're the man. No, you're the man. That kind of a routine. <laughs> we got together. I told him, I, I got this pile of drawings out of, out of your album, Beethoven. And we got together in New York City at a restaurant. And he, we went in and... That was it. We, we started to work together. So it was kind of, I don't know, mystical or magical in a way, in itself. Serendipitous. Yeah. And again, I find out gradually becoming very good friends with Paul. He was one of the, he was an incredible human being. Gene and I both were really good friends with him. 
that he worked at night. And I found it kind of like very strangely synchronistic that I did all the Beethoven stuff at night, which I never worked that way before. Yeah, you, were, you know what I mean? It's kind of yeah. interesting. Anyway, that that's that's my trans and I've been working with them now since then, and, you know, every year. Except obviously the last year they didn't do a concert. Yeah, Gene said I, I did do an album cover. They're be putting out an album. What? New album. There's a new album coming out with uh, music that has never been heard before, and I did the the cover for that. So hopefully we'll see where things are at. God knows I don't know yet uh, about the decision to do a show this year. But we'll see. You know, but again, it, it's as how many years is that, Gene, that we've been working? 18 years. And it's like, holy crap. It's like it went by like that. It's like, <laughs> you, 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 it's weird. Time is like amazing. In any event, that, that's... That's so one of them. I would say that you were influenced by the music. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, it, it's everything that I love. It's the, it's that blending yeah. of classical and rock and roll. I mean, you know, it's it's, yeah. it's just, which I loved ever since Progo Harum. I mean, you know, with that sound that they, I think they were one of the very, fr they were probably the first, right, to start to mix it. Emerson Lake and Palmer and, you know, you got to meet Greg Lake. He, he showed up one year to perform with Paul on one of the shows. He was like amazing. That was fantastic. Cool. And that was just really cool. And Bob Kinkle, who, who chimed in before, you know, is one of the co-creators yep. of the band. <laughs> yep. You know? Yeah. So we got uh, going to switch off of uh, that TSO with one more question here. So mm -hmm. they've seen your self-portrait. Uh, I'm assuming that maybe the one with the... Uh, the flying saucers mm -hmm. in the eyes. But have you ever done a portrait of you and Tim? Together? Is there, is there a yeah, yeah, yeah. The brand, so. Yeah, somewhere there's a picture of us. I'm not sure where. We were, I, I, we were posing together as two wizards. I also, there's the one of you guys, uh, where you're like the statues on the post. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was way back before the Lord of the Rings days. It, for... We did that as a sample in the 70s. Tim and I were doing a lot of children's books and down, you know, Reader's Digest illustrations, advertising illustrations, uh, uh, you know, down to a toilet training book. And then we okay. decided we wanted to try different things out. Let's, let's see what's more interesting. We, we had read the, the, the Hobbit in, in the 60s. And then we read the Lord of the Rings, and we said we got we should illustrate this someday. And one of the things we did while we were doing this other more mundane kind of like illustration, you know, toilet training book, say, uh, we did this painting. We did a self portrait of each other as two statues posing as pedestals in the front of this fantasy house with all these fantasy characters all coming and coming and going out of the house dwarfs and gnomes, little elves and stuff. And then we used that as a sample when we went to Valentine Books to illustrate the Lord of the Rings, along with a bunch of other stuff that we had done, some drawings out of the rings. Yeah. And, you know, so that, yeah. The, the, now, you did, were you doing a portrait of him and he was doing a portrait of you? Well, no, that was another time. No, that, I can't remember how we worked that. Truthfully, but there was another time <laughs> where we did do that. Somebody requested it was for some something in print. I don't even remember what the hell it was. That I would draw a caricature of Tim, and then Tim would draw a caricature of me. And I don't even know where that is right now, but I can remember oh, doing man. that. <laughs> I'd love to see that. I'd love to see it. We've done so much well, artwork. Tell you what, man. Yeah, it is now five thirty. We went. We went Holy deep crap. along today. And uh, obviously, you can stay on the live stream if you so choose. But I've actually, I have an ad job that I have to get to myself. And you have to get so, to your chickens uh, too, don't you? I got to get to my chickens, and then I get Keith. To get to my Keith lives on a beautiful farm, and he's got how many chickens do you have now? <laughs> I right now I've got fourteen. I had twenty. I've uh, I've lost six. Yeah, but, lost. Uh, we're about to, 
we're about to get another uh, group of chicks so that we can ah. we can bring our number back up. Fantastic. So, are we signing <laughs> out? We are, but uh, so uh, Alexander Davenport says your paintings are of the Air Force pinups. How many have you done of those? Air Force? Oh, Air Force? you mean, oh, on yeah. planes, fighter planes. Yeah. Uh, I've done, what, oh. a half a dozen? Five. I painted five pinups on nice. World War II fighter planes. And uh, we'll have to have a whole conversation. That's a whole other gig. Yeah. That, that's, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a whole other story. <laughs> That's amazing. Right. So, yeah. So everybody who's uh, still uh, watching, again, if you like what we're doing, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Please tell your friends uh, that might be interested in it. Come check out all the work at the spiderwebart.com. You can see that logo down in the bottom left of your screen. There you can view all of Greg's fantastic artwork. You can see any of the past shows that we have done uh, on YouTube, as well as seeing uh, Greg paint uh, on some of those planes and things like that. We have a lot of those different videos up on, on the YouTube channel. So uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Wait thanks a minute. for all the questions. One more thing, Keith, about next week? Yes. What we'll be painting? Uh, I'll be, the Godzilla. I, I, I'm going to be painting another commission for a person who wants me to paint a picture. I think we've talked about this, but it's Godzilla fighting Timat. Timat? Timat. Timat. It was a five-headed dragon from Dungeons and Dragons. So I've done the drawing already. Uh, it's been okayed. I've transferred it to the canvas. So, but that one, I'm going to start right from scratch. So you won't be, it won't be completed like this. It'll be a black piece of canvas with the white outline of the figures. And I'll have my colors mixed already. And I'll start to paint, and we'll see what the hell happens. <laughs> yeah, don't jump the gun this time. No. No, I won't. I won't no, let him. I'm, <laughs> I'm looking forward to that, you know, because that's all about light. This this one, well, this I is all about light, too. This is Ted typing or Brittany typing. So, but Ted says, good evening, good to see you guys, and much love from Brittany. Winky face emoji. So. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you all. Hey, guys. And I'm going to sign all out right. now. Good night, Greg. And thank good you. Night. Keith. Keith, yep. for a lovely yep. job. Thanks, As everybody, always. for watching. Thanks, everyone, for coming.